Hi, and welcome to this month's Purple Space Spotlight on interview. So I'm Brendan, Director of Strategy and Networkology here at Purple Space, and we are super excited today. So not only do we have a great guest, um, but we've also changed the format of our Spotlight interview. So you can now watch uh, or listen to interviews as well as, as read the, the written copy as well. So look, this is all uh, as part of our, our aims to kind of further enhance the opportunities that our community have to, to meet and engage with other members of, of, of our world and learn directly from their experiences and the work that they do. Uh, joined by my Purple Space colleague, Lauren Pemberton Nelson. So hi, Lauren, how are you? How excited are you about today? I'm good, I'm really excited. Um, I think I'm really looking forward to hearing about um, the insights that Tyrion has and um, I'm sure our members are gonna learn a lot from it as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, so let's let's bring Tian in. So we're delighted to be joined for this first video uh, iteration of Spotlight by Tian and Brady. So Tian is Global Director for Inclusion at Clifford Chance, so one of our amazing Purple Space members. Hi Tian. How are you, Brendan? Hi, Lauren. Hi. We're doing very well. Thank you. It's great. Thank you for for coming on. Hey, it's no problem. I was just saying, if, if I'm the first one to ever do video, I mean, that's good. It can only go up afterwards. You started on a low stand of what is visually pleasing. So well done, you. That's <laughs> um, it, well, that, it's, that, that isn't part of our plan. We're <laughs> hoping that we start high and, uh, you know, maintain the standard that we're going to set today. Too. Very kind of you. Yes. That's <laughs> But look, it's great to have you. I mean, so Clifford Chance, one of our, you know, one of our members, our most active and, and engaged members. You know, we love the work that Lou Zabo and Ashika Patel do. Um, are just, yeah, really interested to, to bring you in and, and hear your perspective because, you know, in the Purple Space community, we work with disability employee resource group uh, members, uh, leaders, but also allies, champions, and you know, range of different people that are all involved in supporting the yeah. networks and the work that um, our disabled employee leaders do within within their businesses. To start by introducing yourself and maybe a little bit about Clifford Chance for those um, that don't know, but really interested in you know, a little bit about your story. So, what brings you to be working in a global inclusion role? Um, that's a good question. A, a, a ra randomness could be the short answer to this. Um, I, I didn't expect to be. I, 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 I mean, I'm the Global Director of Inclusion at Clifford Chance. Um, I've been here for about two years, get to work with, as you rightly say, you know, Ashika, Lou, and so many other fabulous people in the networks, uh, but came from campaigning. Um, I had been the director of the campaign for marriage equality in Australia, um, referendum was held back in 2018. Um, I should say we were. I was on the yes side. Uh, probably worth clarifying that the unusual director of inclusion uh, to be on the no side, but which thankfully we won. Um, but obviously, from my accent, you can tell how Australian I am. And so I, I was originally in Ireland, where I was the political director of the Irish referendum, and had worked on. Uh, LGBT rights, civil unions, uh, and HIV uh, prevention and raising awareness, you know, for years before that with the National LGBT organization there. So it had always been campaigning. Um, and to be honest, I had no intention of ending up working in a law firm, but, but I was asked to come and talk to Clifford Chance and realized we were talking about the exact same thing. We were talking about, you know, inclusion is a permanent campaign. Um, and you have to think of it that way, that it's not a set of rules or guidelines. It has to live and breathe. It's what people do every day. And, and what does that look like if you think about it through a campaigning lens? Um, and accidentally, I realized we were talking about the same thing. Uh, so ended up coming to work for a, a law firm. And I'll be honest, I went to come to talk to them the first time. I got reached out to them and said, will you come and talk to Clifford Chance? And I went you know what, when am I going to get an hour with Clifford Chance to talk to them about this? I mean, they're never going to hire me, but, you know, hopefully they'll hire someone half decent afterwards. But let's talk to them about what a law firm could be doing around inclusion. And I think that's, in a way, the key, I and mean, I wander a bit on your question, which I warned you I would, is that, but it is that bit about, you know, for a law firm, they should really be the bosses of this. I mean, inclusion, you know, we're talking about it a lot more now, and that's fantastic. And there's a whole new alphabet and lexicon around inclusion. But actually, there's nothing new about the idea of justice. 
And there's nothing new about the idea that everybody should be entitled to equal status and equal standing in society. That's what law firms are supposed to be about. So uh, when we were talking about it, I was, you know, we, getting, getting a law firm to understand, which Clifford Chance, I think, genuinely do, that this isn't new. This is just a, a very old core value of the law which you're supposed to lead. We're not kind of neutrally watching the law develop. You know, you're, you're at the front of shaping it. So surprised myself and ended up here with Clifford Chance. Hopefully we're kicking in an open door uh, and, and tapping into, you know, a real reservoir of desire around the concept of inclusion. But that's by my experience so far in the firm. Yeah, really interesting. I. I was interested to hear your answer about that because I wondered whether the answer was going to be more about something about the role of business more broadly in terms of inclusion, but I, clearly there's an element to that because we're moving into the corporate sector, but actually that as, it's the type, the type of business that, you, that you're in now is, is, is the important part as well. Yeah, I mean, I think so. And I think cause when you think about change around equality, the law's always been stuck in it, whether it's the great cases that go to courts all over the world, whether it's you know the campaigns to change bad law or to remove bad law or create good law, you know the law is just stuck in the middle of this all the time. So hopefully this is not so much transformational, but it's about you know flicking a switch that's already there, um, and using that position within the law then to also work with you know corporates and firms all over the world that aren't law firms, you know to help them as well. So. I mean, I do keep thinking that, you know, ultimately this is about justice. And if law firms aren't good at justice, you know, you really got to question yourself as a law firm. What, what are we up to here if, the, if this isn't what we focus on? So hopefully home ground. Yeah, thank you. That's really insightful. Um, and can you tell us a bit more about sort of why um, disability inclusion matters to, to Clifford Chance and about the, the work that the Enable Network does? Um, um, yeah, I mean, and I, I'll try to be as un-Irish as possible and, and brief. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, first of all, why inclusion matters. I mean, there's the, there's the, there's the value, you know, which of course everybody would hopefully have, which is, you know, that idea that you know inclusion is good for our own people, it's good for their families, it's good for our clients, and it's good for society. So you know, you see that, that broad value good in it, you know, in the broader sense of inclusion. Um, but I think also as firms, we should be really clear-headed about this. It's also absolutely an economic imperative. If you're not empowering all your people, then you're not being as efficient as you could be, and and you know. I think there's nothing wrong with us seeing it both as a value and valuable. Uh, and, and actually, I think the marriage of that is one of those brilliant things where our values and the value of, you know, our, the success of our firms, you know, totally are in tandem with each other. You know, inclusion is, is good for firms and it's good for profit and it's good for economics and it's good for our people. So on the broader inclusion, you know, the, 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 the short one-liner answer. Um, I mean, I, I think for the disability work, you know, I think the challenge is building networks to, to allow people to be visible, allow us to hear the real experiences of people. You know, it's fine for us to talk about inclusion, but within that, there, you know, there's just lived realities. And if we're not building the networks, then we're not learning about that lived reality. I always think, you know, inclusion isn't a what it's a who and if we can't see the who then we won't understand what needs to be done uh, so i think you know the networks that we have in the firm here you know are, are utterly essential to us trying to drive any change you know uh, so our, our new network which is rebranded well which our network which has been newly rebranded as enable and you know Lou Zaber and Sheikha Patel have been, you know, brilliant leaders in that in the in the UK region. Um, but so much of the, the work of that is on this focus of how do we get people to see the who? You know, what is that journey? And, and you know, so uh, you know, we've done this a, a lot outside before I came to the firm. 
we get lost sometimes in thinking about the theory of something. And actually what we found is the number one reason people suddenly become advocates on minority experiences is when they know somebody. Uh, and the people who think about this as, as you know, something that's really important for legal reasons and justice reasons, they already support us. It's the great big middle of our firms that we need to tap into. And when it becomes Margaret or Joseph, now people go, oh, I totally get this. Now I'm on board, what can I do? And people really step up. So, you know, the network is so critical for that, about, you know, putting that who into the what, if that makes sense, uh, uh, Lauren. So I think they've been brilliant at it, to be honest. They've done, you know, incredible work in, uh, over the last couple of years of, you know, profiling the human stories and, and supporting people to become, you know, role models, you know, and that's tricky. Not everybody, actually most people, when they hear the word uh, that I have to stand up and talk about myself, go on, oh, I'd rather not. Um, so having networks that support that is so important because just presuming people are going to stand up and tell their story unsupported, that's not going to happen, especially when you have so much stigma around, you know, the real life experiences of people, you know, of, of different abilities. Yeah, thank you. I think that is certainly a big theme in our, um, with our members that to make a, the, the best way to make the difference is through telling those stories is through mm -hmm. adding that personal element and I think with our leadership theme um, for February of uh, leading by learning um, that's something that like a lot of it is not just focused on like you know learning the statistics or learning about these policies but it's about learning from other people um, and gaining insight from that. Absolutely I mean if we think about ourselves as statistics, we're not going to create any real change. I mean, that that's, it, it is. And when you think about it, again, coming from campaigning outside, and a lot of that was on LGBT plus equality, disability faces the same one, can face very similar challenges. One, there's a lot of invisibility. So you could, for, for many people uh, who have certain disabilities and for LGBT people, that's not very visible sometimes. So creating that visibility is so important um, in the first instance. But also you have to really work at pulling out the human stories, which is why what you're doing is so great. Because with all the new focus on inclusion, we have quite a focus on all the new language of inclusion too. And it's complicated and we keep changing the rules. So we keep changing the language every couple of weeks. And we have to make sure that's not the barrier to someone standing up for Margaret or standing up for Lauren or standing up for Patrick you know, allowing them to get straight past that lexicon sometimes is really important. And, and focusing on the human stories, you know, really get faces down that challenge that I think is very real in the corporate world that we, we want people to be advocates, not experts. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the corporate world tends to make us feel the opposite journey is required. You, you want to be the expert before you open your mouth in a meeting. And for inclusion, that's a barrier. That's a real problem for us. You know, we have to allow people to feel confident to ask Margaret how she's feeling or ask John, is everything okay? Uh, and to be honest, what we found was people really did want to have those conversations, but weren't confident that they'd get the language right. And that was preventing them having the conversation. And that means we were losing advocates because people feared, you know, it feared being disrespectful on the journey to trying to be respectful. And, and that's a, something we have to make sure that we don't fall into as a trap. So creating that human visibility, the, the work that you're doing on that, it's just, it's just so important. We have to demystify being an advocate. Campaigning should be fun and simple and, and joyful. Um, not something we fear stepping into in case, you know, you know, we press the wrong button and the entire room explodes. So, yeah. which is very real right now. Yeah. With, look, in terms of sort of raising the visibility and providing a mechanism for having better conversations about, about, about disability, I wanted to ask you a question about, in, in our experience, one of the kind of, in a kind of recent mechanisms of change, our Purple Light Up movement, which 
was founded four years ago, almost by accident, by Purple, Purple Space. Our, our founder, Kate Nash, sent out a rogue tweet into the world about, uh, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if, if the world turned purple in, as a mark of respect to the International Day of Persons with Disability? So that, it's, we used to call it a campaign. It started as a campaign. Um, yeah. It's now a, a movement is a more appropriate term because a campaign, I guess, implies a structure, a start, a middle, and then end. You know, this is a global movement now that happens without real, you know, any kind of coordination. And you see uh, conversations happening in every corner of the globe now. So um, we know that Clifford Chance, you know, that have really embraced that movement, and it seems to be useful to you as an organisation as a way of having conversations about, about disability. Um, yeah. So just, yeah, interested, like, why does it, why does that resonate with you? Why is it such a useful mechanism for you? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of ones. One, you know, creating visibility for something that there could be significant barriers to creating visibility on. You know, I mean, it's fine for us in a way to talk as, as well about human stories, but, you know, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, and firms have to find ways of messaging that out very clearly. I mean, uh, that this is a space where you want, you, we, we want to hear from you and we know you're there. Um, and especially for, you know, things that are hidden. And I think, you know, the purple lighted up were, was, you know, is really brilliant in that it, it, it creates that high level visibility that's required to try and create space for people to step into. And not just people uh, you know, with disabilities, um, but also people who want to be allies and advocates. That's just creating a space and sending that clear message through that high visibility campaigning of going, this is something that we prioritize, you know, and this is something you can get involved in and can become a campaigner for in this firm. So I find the campaign really great for that, you know, in terms of you know, visuals. I think the other one is, it allows us to do something that brings offices together. It's I mean, you know, we're spread out over all, you know, every continent apart from Antarctica. So how do we visually demonstrate a commitment that brings people in across that network, especially when you're dealing with countries, you know, that are in all, a whole range of different spaces on their journey towards equality. So it's finding something as straightforward as, as a common strand, a common moment that can connect offices is really important because the one thing I learned all the time with great campaigns is nobody knows everything and everybody knows something. Uh, and so there will be someone in an office in Tokyo that has a brilliant initiative that's really creating change there and no one in Brussels knows about it. So how do you, you know, having that binding international campaign moment that allows people to talk to each other, you know, is just fantastic for us so you know i think both in terms of visibility in terms of connectivity it's a brilliant idea uh, and you know I, I, we can already see the impact of it where offices that didn't know there was something to connect into you know pick up the phone and go wow you know we want to get involved so yeah. thanks <laughs> <laughs> well look we're just thrilled that that you have embraced not only embraced it but found it useful yeah, i love the way that you describe it as a space that people can step into because you know for us it's I mean it's always been more more than you know simply about purple light bulbs for example it is about creating that space where the change can then happen um, you know so we're seeing you know organizations launching networks for example on choosing to use that as a hook to to, to improve things to, to take um, specific actions and I just you know I mentioned that we started off thinking of it as a campaign and kind of lost control in a good way and it's now a movement and just given your background one of the things that we're doing Lauren and, and, and myself and the rest of the team is we're looking now you know what's next for, for Purple Light Up and you know, just interested in your experience with the campaigns that you've worked in because you know, one of the things we've always seen it as a kind of pride movement or a potential pride movement mm -hmm. in the disability space as well so just yeah, interested on your, in your thoughts in terms of the, the future based on your experience. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that, that I'd be really excited about. If, if we're thinking about storytelling and human stories, you know, and, and back to your point about the space, one of the things I think we have to think about, well, what stops people entering that space currently? You know, and, and that gets back to the expert versus advocate point where in the end, 
the real campaign that creates real change is when people are all across different firms at all different levels feel confident to have these conversations uh, and feel happy to talk to each other and even just to check in with each other sometimes. So we have to recognize that, you know, the world outside our buildings isn't creating that space. It's kind of pulling the space away from us. So you have to actually, as you think about the next phase of going, understand we have to actively create and protect that space where people can feel confident about walking in, about not being an expert, about simply learning, you know, how to be a great advocate and empathetic, you know, without feeling they have to have a PhD in sociology or in some aspect of inclusion. Because we don't need people to reach that level of expertise. We need people to be able to pick up the phone or reach out to somebody. Um, so I think for a campaign perspective, one of the challenges I found you know, when we were talking about LGBT equality as a minority experience was that fear of conversation, not because they didn't support it, but because they didn't want to get it wrong. And people are going to stumble. And we know this, the language around disability is, it can be quite fraught as well, just as it is on LGBT, just as it is on ethnicity. I mean, you know, we had a great minister in the government actually in Ireland, uh, and he campaigned for uh, marriage equality all the time. And he was from a rural constituency, but he was a brilliant advocate for marriage equality, but he kept campaigning for BLTs. So he was on the radio and he was in the TV and he's doing the newspapers and he kept saying the BLTs deserve equality. We have to give equality to the BLTs. Now he's campaigning for sandwiches for a year and a half. Um, but that's okay. That has to be okay. That The journey he's on is the right one. He's out there, you know, making space for people and championing equality. And you know, is he an expert? No. Will he ever be an expert? No, it's not in his bandwidth. Um, and for people who work in our firms, which is so important for what you're doing, you know, we have to recognize that people's bandwidth is so challenged. Everyone's so busy. So we have to, our job as a campaign isn't to set up a stall and say, hey, everybody, you have to come over here. Our job as a campaign is to go to everybody. It's not their job to come to us. We have to make it really easy for busy people to be brilliant advocates. And the other two things I would say very briefly about this is, and you mentioned this when you talked about a movement. I mean, in a way, it's a campaign, but it is a permanent campaign. There's no finish line. And, and that's really important for us because that means we have to continuously campaign and champion. Um, and even when we win, it means we have to keep promoting. We can't take the, the win for granted. Um, and also within that, it's a voluntary campaign. So people don't have to join if they don't want to. So if you have a permanent campaign that is also voluntary, then you have to build something that people want to join, A, and B, when they do join, that they want to stay. Uh, and that's if we keep those as our guiding principles, we can build campaigns that people get joy, empowerment, inspiration from. Because this is a journey that has to feel like the goal because we know we're never actually reaching a finish line. So that would be... That's a longer answer, isn't it? Sorry. But I think making that space, making that space enjoyable, understanding that people have to want to walk through the door because, you know, they don't have to. They could ignore us if they want to. And, and that's disaster for us. So, you know, you got to build a party people want to turn up at and, and stay at. But we can. And, and, and that's the great thing. Once we understand that, we can build brilliant campaigns that are self-sustaining and create real change. Right. Hey, thank you. Yeah, fascinating answer. Just so much learning in there. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Hey, no problem. <laughs> um, so you have uh, Enable Groups in the UK and uh, in Australia. And uh, I know that uh, Enable is looking to become a global network um, this year. Um, so what are your sort of key hopes um, that you're looking to achieve and how are you going to approach this? Um, I think, you know, obviously we've used your campaign as a real springboard this year, you know, to create that high level of visibility. Um, I mean, and Australia is a really good example of that. You know, Australia, you know, the, the campaign this year in December became a trigger for Australia going, oh, we want to do more. Um, and that wouldn't have happened without being able to do the Purple campaign. 
Um, and so the first thing is that, to say thank you. But I, I think expanding this is about trying to, trying to build space for people's capacity. So we would like to see new networks build up across our global firm. Um, I, I think as well as that, we have to build a global level to support that. Again, rep recognizing people are super busy. You, again, you have to make this easy um, for people to step into. You know, knowing that you know, if any lockdown has maxed out, you know, people's free time because we just spend so much time staring into screens now. You know, and that can be a bit of a challenge for us trying to then say, oh, actually, we'd like you to stare into another screen for another hour uh, to talk about how we're going to drive something else. So we've used your campaign to springboard that, to be honest. It's allowed us to, you know, pick, highlight, pinpoint, identify um, people who are really interested in this space um, and then take them on the journey of the next step, building their capacity to become great advocates. Uh, the other thing, though, that we can do that complements that all the time, again, as a law firm, going full circle on what we were talking about today is, you know, we have capacity to do great pro bono work. And of course, there's a lot of, laws that need to be written, laws that need to be challenged around the world about disability. Um, so there, there is a lot to be done and that we can, uh, we can do through our pro bono teams and support that we can provide to organizations like, you know, like Invictus, like the Valuable 500, like, like you know, at a pro bono level. So again, finding work that's rewarding for people. And what we found is exactly that. When you create those doorways, you know, people find that so rewarding, uh, but also understanding you have to kind of help people by building the doorways in the first place because people are so busy. But I, I think this year what we'll see is more networks, thanks to the Purple Campaign, um, you know, more connectivity at a global level and at, and at regional levels because of that. Um, and that allows us to really understand where regions are and the cultural differences behind all of those so that we can, you know, build campaigns that are relevant to people and that connect with the values they have. You, know, you have to make sure all the time if you're campaigning, you don't look like you're New York centric or Paris centric or London centric or wherever your headquarters is in your firm. You know, it, it, people have to see this might be a global value, but it has to be locally owned um, or else people will just ignore it. And they won't, won't let them. Thank you for that. I think um, especially sort of the pro bono work and using that in relation to continuing to make change on a global, um, on a global and regional level is, is really inspiring. Well, hopefully, and I think, you know, uh, you can see it all the time, the reward people get out of great campaigning. That's the one thing I would say to everybody that watches this is, you know, campaigning should feel like the goal you're selling uh, and you should devise things that people want to come back to all the time in their busy world. Uh, and when we get that right, when we get that tone right, you know, it's so important. And, and if anything, I would say to understand that the tone outside our buildings isn't always reflective of that, you know, joyful, inclusive, respectful, celebratory journey that this needs to feel like which means we have to work doubly hard at it because they keep the tone that we set is the tone that the most vulnerable person we're trying to campaign for will have to live with long after we've stopped campaigning. And, and I think that needs to be one of the, you know, our, our guiding stars on this all the time, you know, build something people want to join. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Sintin, and this is a conversation that we could have for at least another three or four hours, I feel. Um, so much learning in here. And you, Lauren mentioned at the, at the start of the call that our leadership theme, our purple space leadership theme for this month is leading by learning. So it's really all about how can uh, disability employee network resource group leaders improve their own performance, which then you know, has that knock-on impact for, for colleagues around them by learning from other network leaders, but also other leaders from other, other, other areas, you know, so the experience that you are bringing to bear in this conversation about from campaigning on a different related area, like it's just so useful, but I just wanted to end with a, a question in terms of your own leadership and your own leadership style that you've developed over, over the years, 
what are the most valuable lessons that you have learned? Um, there's probably a couple. I, I, I mean, one is you never know everything uh, and you never will. Um, and I think a couple of pieces is one that, if we took one or two of them, one, the tone matters. Um, we campaign all the time on issues and, and we tend to forget that what most people do is they just pick up little bits of what you said. So busy people, you know, you think you've, you've pro produced the greatest ever interview, but most people would have been washing the dishes or driving the car while you were doing it. And they'll have picked up a bit of it. And if you go back to them 10 minutes later, they'll probably have forgotten quite a bit of it, if, if not all of it. Um, but they will remember what you sounded like. So creating an environment that feels like your goal was one of the most important pieces of learning I always thought we had. The second one was understanding that you have a lot of advocates out there who aren't confident about their expertise to walk in. And your duty is to allow them to. And again, sometimes we can see around inclusion that that's not what we're doing, that what we're actually doing is creating a lexicon of language that intimidates people a little into going, okay, if in doubt, say nothing. That, I, I think the other one that, that I always love is when you're building a campaign, people are more persuasive than you are. I mean, you think you're, you're like the Wizard of Oz behind a curtain and all these levers and you're changing everything and it's gonna be fantastic. But actually the real campaigns that succeed are the ones that empower people to see how powerful they are. And individuals don't always see that. When you think about it, there's nobody who is a better ambassador for your values in your space than you. So how does a campaign create that empowerment that allows people to see, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really influential uh, you know, on my floor, with my team, in my family. I mean, I can design the best campaign in the world, but it'll still not be as, impact, as impactful as when we've empowered individuals to own their own space and, and to see how powerful they are. I think that was, a lot of campaigns don't want to do that. A lot of campaigns like to think, you know, I own truth. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to be played out here. And I'm going to run it by remote control. You're going, that's great campaigning empowers people because it turns out people in Singapore understand Singapore better than I do. And that's not a surprise, but for some reason, campaigns find it surprising. And, and the last one I would say, honestly, is because the, I've always seen these as voluntary campaigns and that we need to make people want to join, so I always keep thinking, there used to be an old Irish phrase that, you know, the uh, Irish diplomacy is the ability to tell a man to go to hell in such a way that he looks forward to the trip. Uh, and I think for inclusion and campaigning, we're not trying to get people to go to hell. We're trying to get people to go somewhere the exact opposite. We're trying to get them to go somewhere utterly fabulous. And we're convinced of that. Um, and that, that involves us building campaigns that people want to join uh, and empowering people into it and making sure we don't fall into the trap that we fell into for years in LGBT campaigns. You know, we can't shame someone into being a supporter and we can't guilt them into being a supporter or condemn them into being a supporter. We found out pretty early on that, you know, if we could simply calling people homophobic didn't turn them into supporters. There was nobody out there who went, well, thank you for telling me how awful I am. Now that I know I'm homophobic, I shall support you forever. We don't think like that and we shouldn't campaign like that. When we let people walk in towards us and created a space where they could have conversation, that was a real transformational moment. And I think having enough confidence in your own message to allow people to, to walk through that door and talk to us is everything. That's a longer answer. I apologize, but... It's all, it's all good. There's so much in there. You know, that first point reminded me of Maya Angelou's quote about people not necessarily remembering what you said or, or did, but remembering how, they, how you made them feel. Mm. There is so much in there, so much in there. Um, but look, we've come to the end of our time. So hopefully our audience has enjoyed this first iteration of our more interactive uh, visual and audio spotlight experience. Tune in. 
thank you so much for for being being the first to come on and do it this way yeah no problem brendan no problem lauren lovely to lovely to get to talk to you hopefully it's useful i will be (laughs) yes and yeah like if you have enjoyed if you have enjoyed this episode then tune in for the next one so we've got uh, some exciting guests coming up. We've got Alia Cooper and Ian Stewart from HSBC, so the global chair of HSBC's Ability Network and the UK CEO, who's also the exec champion for that global network as well. So uh, lots more learning over, over the months to come. So uh, Tin, and thank you again. It's been just brilliant to have you on and really enjoyed learning from you. Yeah. Thank Bye. you so much.